But uh, today we're going to be in the seventh week of our series on a generous life. And today we're going to be talking about the, the story, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. That's where we've been for seven weeks. And if you remember, John the Baptist, one of Jesus' best friends, his head was removed, he was beheaded, um, and a, a terrible twist of political um, games and trickery that uh, Jesus took off to, to go hang out with his disciples and get some R&R. And his disciples um, were looking forward to that and crowds followed Jesus. And, and uh, Jesus looked at the crowds and instead of being frustrated, was moved with compassion. He decided that he wanted to feed the crowds to give them dinner. And so he looked at one of his disciples, Andrew, and said, or Philip, and said, what are we going to do? And, and Philip, he said, I don't think we can do it. He looked at Andrew and said, Andrew, what are we going to do? And Andrew brought a little boy with some loaves and some fish and said, this is all I got. What can you do? And Jesus said, watch. He looked up, he gave thanks to God the Father. He broke these crackers and passed out these crackers and fish to the disciples who in turn passed them to the crowd. The crowd was entirely fed. And after they were entirely fed, there were 12 baskets left over. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today, 12 baskets. We've been talking about living a generous life, learning to live a different way. And it doesn't take very long to learn to live a different way. We can learn new habits pretty quickly. I was in Arkansas last week and uh, I love going to Arkansas because my people are there. My sons, Nathan and Richard, my daughter-in-law, Eden. And I would say most importantly, but it offends my son and daughter-in-law and other son, Emery, my granddaughter, who's 15 months old. And so we went and hung out with them. And um, Emery has now taken over our bathroom, which is okay. Uh, we used to have a bathroom when we were there in a bedroom. And then they moved us to sort of a, a different bedroom. And now Emery has the bathroom and the bedroom, which I think is gonna become more and more uh, of an issue. The longer we go and visit them, sharing a bathroom with a little girl, 15 months old is not a big deal. With 15 year old, maybe a little bit bigger deal. So Joy is trying to think of other options. But when we go there, we sleep in a double bed. And I've shared this with you before. Um, two of us in a double bed, um, you know, if you're not married, it may sound romantic. After you've been married for a while, it sounds inconvenient. We have a king size bed now, we have for years. And um, when it's snuggle time, you snuggle. And when it's sleepy time, you can sleep. And they have a double bed. And we have a full size dog, um, Daisy, a full size poodle. And uh, we were sleeping, two of us in a double bed, and uh, Daisy was sleeping with us, and we didn't sleep much. And uh, we switched sides of the bed. I like the side with the tactical advantage. Joy likes the side closest to the bathroom. Joy wins, and we switch sides of the bed. And so uh, to me, it wasn't any big deal. You lay down, you go to sleep, you wake up, no big deal. For Joy, it was a little bit bigger deal. She um, apparently got used to it, formed a habit. We got home Friday night. We were exhausted, having not slept for, you know, five nights. And um, I'm on my side of the bed, minding my own business, sound asleep. About three o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, the covers are ripped off of me. Woof, like that. Um, now, highly unusual, um, not Joy style. Uh, I did my best Matthew McConaughey. I was like, all right, all right, all right. And, and Joy looked at me and she said, what are you doing on my side of the bed? I said, I'm not on your side of the bed. I thought I had a stroke or something. And I looked over my nightstand, you know, my phone. And she went, oops, my bad. I'm used to sleeping at Richard and Eden's. Whoop, threw the covers right back up, went over and went to sleep. And there I am wondering what in the world happened. It only took her five days to develop a new habit. And for us, I know it's okay. Um, weird story has a point. For us, we can develop habits very, very quickly. And um, we can live different ways very, very quickly. We've only, we've only been working on this for five, six, seven weeks, but yet many of us are choosing to live a different way. And I wanna see that for you today. I wanna see that for you as we finish next week. I want you to see it for each other. So look at each other, look to your left and look to your right. And um, I want you to look at somebody and I just want you to tell them, just, it's easy, I just want you to break the ice with them. I want you to say good morning, left and right. Good morning, good morning, left and right, okay. Now, I want you to look at the person to your left. I want you to look at the person to your left. If you don't have somebody on your left, do your best. Somebody on your left, I want you to say the number 12. Say 12. Okay, I want you to look at the person on your right and I want you to say the number seven. All right. 
And um, I want you to remember 12 and 7. That's going to come back in just a minute. We're going to talk about that. It's going to be important. We are going to sort of take a snippet from the feeding of the 5,000 and jump to the feeding of the 4,000. And the number 12 and the number 7 are going to be relevant and important for you. And we are going to need to remember them. I'm going to try to talk to you today about the blessed life and what living a blessed life really means. And I want to do that this morning in a way that I trust God's going to use in all of our lives to help us live differently. So let's pray real quickly. Father, as we open your word, speak to us, give us strength and ability to hear, to see, and to be changed. Allow us to be fully present in this moment and whatever it is that we've come in with today, whatever burden, let us cast it aside. Let us trust you, Father, that even though we have cares and concerns of our heart, that you will do the caring for us. This morning, we wanna learn from you. We wanna live differently and we trust that you're gonna do that in Jesus' name, amen. So let's look together. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Jesus had fed 5,000 people, 25,000 people perhaps. And Jesus had instructed them to gather all that's left over. Nothing was wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves and fish that were left. The disciples were sitting in the grass and eating. And as the disciples were seated in the grass and eating, they had a discussion. And I believe the discussion probably went like this. Isn't this crazy? But isn't this awesome? Jesus used us to serve. Jesus used us to be part of a miracle that changed people's lives. Isn't it crazy? But isn't it awesome? Now, a few weeks later, Jesus did almost the same miracle with the same disciples, but to an entirely different group of people. And I wanna talk about that miracle today. And I want us to arrive at the same conclusion. Isn't it unlikely? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it special and awesome? After the feeding of the 5,000, the same 20,000 people, Jesus traveled up north of the Sea of Galilee and around the top and down the other side into an area called the Decapolis. The Decapolis literally means 10 cities. It was a Gentile area. It went over the Hermon mountain range. And once again, Jesus decided he was going to feed another group of people. Some people think it's the same miracle. It's an entirely different miracle, but has some similar characteristics. So Jesus, with his disciples, in almost an exact setting, did something similar but different because the meaning and the application completed something that God the Father had been working on for a long time. There was a Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee and a Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus had come to unite both sides of people. There would no longer be us and them. There would no longer be the spiritually elite and those spiritual outcasts. There would no longer be people who were my people and people who were your people. Jesus had come to unite. So let's look at this story. It sounds similar, but I'm gonna hopefully point out to you how it's a little bit different. And I think we'll have some fun with it. Jesus left there, went along the Sea of Galilee, and then he went up to a mountainside and he sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at Jesus' feet. Now, this is a Gentile crowd, a group of people who weren't used to the things that God or Jesus had done before. They hadn't had experience with this. And the Bible literally says that as they heard about Jesus and knew the kinds of things that he did, that they were bringing people who needed to meet him and flinging them, that's the literal use of the word, at Jesus' feet. So what they were doing is they were going and grabbing people who they thought needed to meet Jesus and they were flinging them at Jesus' feet. And in a sense, it was like piling them up at Jesus' feet, letting him sort them out. And I love thinking about our church in that way. As a matter of fact, it could be a new slogan for our church. We could be the bringing and flinging church, right? 
You could bring a friend who you know needs to meet Jesus. Perhaps maybe there's somebody here today who needs to meet Jesus. You didn't have to explain to Jesus the issues going on in the person's life. You didn't have to justify or rationalize. Simply make the introduction, bring and fling. And as they were doing that and flinging somebody at Jesus' feet, they would go and grab another person and bring that person to Jesus and lay them at Jesus' feet. And Jesus was doing amazing miracles. He was healing. He was healing them of all kinds of diseases. He was healing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And people were amazed because they had seen lame people walking and blind people seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus then called his disciples and he said, I have compassion on these people. Now, compassion is being moved in your gut to action. They've already been with me three days and they have nothing to eat. I don't wanna send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. Now, collapse is an interesting word. Collapse means um, it's like stringing a bow. A bow is tight with a, a bow string. You unstring the bow, it's not tight anymore. It, in a sense, collapses. I don't want them to collapse, to be unstrung. And so he says to his disciples, we need to feed them. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Now, doesn't this seem reminiscent of what happened in the previous miracle? These were not dumb men. These were men who had great faith. These were men who had seen Jesus do a miracle. It was almost the exact same kind of a miracle. But the problem is these were different people receiving the miracle. Jesus was among Gentiles. And Gentiles were people who many Jews, including the disciples, didn't feel like they had a right to know who Jesus was. They just weren't their kind of person. There was a divide, the Sea of Galilee, and the disciples and other Jews liked it that way. And so when the Bible says that the disciples said to Jesus, how are we gonna feed such a crowd? I think they were talking about the size of the crowd and I also believe that they were talking about the makeup of the crowd. Is there any group of people in your life who you have a hard time liking? Anybody you have a hard time loving? Anybody who you feel like if you had your druthers, you might rather them not meet Jesus at all. Some Christians, we find ourselves separating ourselves intentionally from everyone else in this world so much so that we label, we judge, we ignore. At best, occasionally lobbing insults over the wall of our churches, hoping that it hits somebody who may look a little differently, who may act a little differently, who might be from a different place, who may vote a little differently than we do. And we find ourselves oftentimes with the same attitude that the disciples had and Jesus came to crush it. Where could we get enough bread? Now they're acknowledging their need for Jesus to feed such a crowd, these kind of people. And Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground and then he took the seven loaves and the fish and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples and they in turn to the people. Very similar. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls. Now remember 12 from the first miracle. Remember seven from this miracle because it's significant of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men Besides women and children, after Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and he went into the vicinity of the Magadon. Now, a couple of things to be thinking of. One, Jesus was teaching the disciples that their job was to serve. Serving was beneath a man in this time or this time period, serving anyone in the sense of serving food and waiting tables and what the disciples had been asked to do. In the first miracle, they were asked to serve on one side of the Sea of Galilee. So they were asked to do something they perceived as beneath them. 
but yet to people who they kind of liked and sort of hoped that if they go to heaven, they may be in the same part of heaven as these people. And then Jesus takes them around the top of the Sea of Galilee and back down over a mountain range into the Decapolis and to a group of people who the disciples had been taught to hate and to fear and who really didn't think the kingdom of God or Christianity was for them at all and would have been perfectly happy for them to be excluded from the gospel, not included. And Jesus had asked them to serve them too. That was mind blowing. They'd watched Jesus act with compassion for the churches and also Jesus moved with compassion for those who looked like they were far from God. And you'll see in a minute that both groups were far from God. It was just that the religious group that were part of the 5,000 or 25,000 were skeptical, were informed, were not sure that Jesus who was who he says that he was. Constantly looking for an angle, asking for more signs. And then you have a group over here on this side, who the Bible says when they receive these miracles, they begin to worship and be in awe at the God of Israel because they had no context. They had never seen these kinds of things before. And Jesus was uniting. He was using his people to be uniters, not dividers. He was teaching his disciples, his people, how to serve. He was showing them that if they followed Jesus himself, that he would lead them into a life that they never expected for themselves, but one that could be considered truly blessed. Now we're gonna sing a few songs and in just a minute, we're gonna come back and I hope to apply this in a way where you will see that a couple things are significant. One, the number that I told you to say to the person next to you, do you remember what that was? One number was 12. The other number was seven. Okay. You have one miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 or probably 25,000. And that was done primarily for the Jewish people. And then you have the feeding of the 4,000, which was done just a few months later. And this was for the Gentile people who were non-Jews, or as you and I might consider everybody else. So remember these things, that Jesus was uniting his people, that he was blowing the disciples' minds, and he was teaching them that if they truly wanted to live a blessed life, they had to learn to be people who served all people just like Jesus did. Father, as we go into a time of singing, you guys ever used adaptive cruise control? Anyone use that? Raise your hands if you know what adaptive cruise control is. For those of you who don't know what it's called, it's a little button that you push on your, in your car. Usually it's on one of the little levers that, you know, kind of like a turn signal, but different. And you set your cruise controller and it has radar that comes out the front of your car and keeps you at a certain distance behind whatever it is that you're following. Um, does that make anybody have that? We took a trip, this last trip this last week, and we used adaptive cruise control. And it's awesome if you find somebody that's going a little faster than you feel comfortable going, but you want to go behind them because you think they'll get the ticket if they get stopped. And I know that's probably a myth. Cops probably stop everybody, but I found somebody like that. They're going a little faster than I was comfortable with. I won't tell you how fast that was. And I got up behind them and set the adaptive cruise control and adjusted it right to where I wanted it. And the cool thing is that when they speed up, it allows you to speed up at just the same distance behind them that you were. If they slow down, it slows you down, you know, the same distance that you are supposed to be. And you can follow that way. And it's impossible to go faster than the person in front of you because your adaptive cruise control keeps you where you're supposed to be. Now, I do wish that the adaptive cruise control had a feature where when the person slows down in front of you, and that it gets right up on their tail and flashes the bright lights a few times so that they can speed up and that you can go as fast as you want to. But in a sense, I believe Jesus was teaching his disciples that they needed to follow him and set their adaptive cruise control. They constantly had an idea of what their plan was for Jesus and what their idea was for Christianity. And Jesus continued to tell them to follow, to stay behind him, 
to go where he was leading. And in this particular situation, Jesus was leading them into uncharted territory. So set your adaptive cruise control, be committed to follow the one in front of you, not too fast and not too slow, and we'll all end up living a blessed life. Jesus met him in the middle. The Sea of Galilee had a Jewish side and a Gentile side, and there were more Jews on the other side of where the Gentiles lived, right off the shore of the Sea of Galilee, but Jesus met his disciples in this passage that I wanna to read to you. They're looking for lunch. The disciples had forgotten to bring any bread. Can you imagine? Anybody ready for lunch right now? I'm a little hungry. Thank you for your honesty. Usually about this time on a Sunday morning, people begin to think about lunch. Uh, you may know where your lunch plans, where you have lunch plans. Maybe now that I've said it, you really want to go to lunch and you're not going to listen to me the rest of the, the time I'm talking to you. But they were hungry. They were looking for lunch. They're human. And Jesus looks at them and says, okay, time to eat. They're in the middle of the lake that divides two types of people who hate each other. And Jesus meets them in the middle, always teaching. And he says to them, okay, what you got? Let's eat. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for only one loaf that they'd had with them. And then Jesus says something they think is bizarre, kind of crazy, but never, well, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the leaven of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed it with each other and they said, what is Jesus talking about? Is this because we forgot lunch? And what he's talking about is he's saying, I want you to beware or be careful of both sides. One side, the hyper-religious, judgmental, nobody's good enough for God side, who wants to put their foot on the neck of everyone else to prove their superiority reveling in the fact that they can keep people out and that only an exclusive group of people actually fit. And Jesus said, that's disgusting. But be careful of the other side. In this case, it was the Gentile side, the leaven of Herod, who represented all of the values of those who didn't even know about the one true God. The political aspirations and the financial, the desire to, to gain at any cost. And he said, you have to understand that there's only one place to meet. And the one place to meet is in the middle, which is the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. He said, no longer can you divide the sides. They're all your kind of people. And lots of Christians nod their head and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in reality, we say, no, no, no. Because we divide the world around us according to people who we think deserve Jesus. And we think there's some people who probably shouldn't find Jesus at all. And Jesus said, watch out for the yeast of both the Pharisees. Let's go back one slide, sorry. And that of Herod. So they discussed it with themselves and they just understood. They're like, I guess this is because we forgot the food. Now, Jesus sort of chastises them a little bit here. He said to them, he said, is this because you can't see or understand or your heart's hard? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves and the 5,000 or for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? How many did they pick up? 12. Now, basketfuls, two different words for basket. The word for the basket that the Jews carried around with them was kofanos. It was a small lunch basket that would have um, had a lid on it that would only have a little hole in the lid that you could stick your hand down in and take your food out. And it was a personal, like a lunchbox, like we talked about two weeks ago. And the reason it was covered is because they didn't want anyone to accidentally touch their food and defile it so that they would be unclean before God when they ate it. The kind of lunchbox the Jews carried around was the kind of lunchbox that would keep the people on the other side of the lake from even accidentally touching their food because they believed that if they touched their food, that it would render them unclean before God. But there were 12 small baskets very characteristic of any Jewish person they would carry their lunchbox. In the Old Testament, God talks about choosing the nation of Israel because they were small and mighty. And we give them a bad rap a lot because by the time of Jesus, the leaders of many or a lot of the Jewish people had become corrupt. 
But not all the Jewish people were corrupt and Jesus himself was a Jew and the disciples were Jews and God chose these people and he said it's because they were small and they were mighty and they became 12 tribes. And we talked about the 12 brothers and how that developed and evolved. But the word that's used for basket in the first miracle is very specific and every time it's referred to, it's the same word for small basket. And there were how many? 12. How many tribes? 12. Any mistake or accident? I don't think so. So Jesus continues and he says, and when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? And they answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? Now the word, the Gentile word, for basket, it's actually a Jewish word, but it's the word that's used for the baskets here that the Gentiles carried, was large basket. Two different words, two different baskets. The same word that was used to refer to the escape that the apostle Paul made in Acts, I believe it's Acts chapter nine, when he was lowered over the side or out a window and over the side of a wall, big enough for a person to fit in, but there were only seven of them, which I think is interesting large baskets. Why am I belaboring the point? Because I think Jesus is belaboring this point and he's making it again here in the middle of a lake. And he's, he said, how many pieces did you pick up? And they said, seven baskets full. And then he said to them, do you still not understand? Now, let me take you back to Deuteronomy here. Don't tune me out. I promise we're going to land this quickly and I hope it's going to hit home. But in Deuteronomy, when the children of Israel were coming to take over the promised land, God chose the Jewish people to use to bring about Jesus and where we are right now. And to do that, he defeated a lot of Gentile nations. That's the way it was. And in Deuteronomy, the instructions that God gave or that God had given to the leaders, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to possess, which was similarly, similar to the land that they were in when Jesus did this miracle or both miracles, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you're entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you, but only seven. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you've defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Now you're like, well, didn't they destroy them entirely? Well, no, it was figurative. They destroyed them from a military and government perspective where they could come into the promised land and live. But the descendants of these seven and others lived in the Decapolis, which is exactly where Jesus did this miracle, the feeding of the 4,000, where he came to unite his people. So what God had divided, God the Father, in the Old Testament for a period of time and for a purpose, Jesus had come to unite. And he said, the gospel is for everyone. And you don't get to have your people anymore. Now for them, that meant something mind blowing for the disciples sitting there in the grass after watching both of these miracles, maybe understanding why Jesus would have compassion on the Jews but absolutely having no clue why Jesus would have compassion on these heathen Gentiles. In the middle of the lake, listening to Jesus' words. And then Jesus asking him the question, do you still, do you still not get it? Well, I think there are three different ways for us to, to apply this. And I think this is what the disciples learned. The first is that salvation has been provided by Jesus and it's for anyone who will come. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, and I may have skipped this passage here for the guys, thank you. But there he says, there's one loaf and we who are many are one body for we shall all share one loaf. Now enough of the bread, enough of the food, I get it, right? We get the analogy, but Jesus is talking about himself. In the book of John, Jesus says, I am the way, I'm the truth and the life. He says, anyone who wants to come to the father can come to the Father. Anyone who wants to come to the Father, it doesn't matter what your past has been like, it doesn't matter the current condition of the sin or the consequences or the concerns or complications in your life, it doesn't matter. 
If you come to Jesus and through Jesus, anyone can come to the Father. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. If you wanna come, you can come and I got you. A blessed life is a life where your eternity is secured. And the disciples were learning this. And then Jesus in both miracles healed people. People who had pretty significant issues. He gave sight to people who couldn't see. He gave ears to people who couldn't hear voices to people who couldn't speak. A person who didn't have a limb, Jesus would give a limb to. And what I think this shows is that Jesus' compassion doesn't just extend to heaven and the life beyond, but that he cares about our lives here on this earth. And these were lifelong problems that these people had. And Jesus is saying, I can solve your lifelong problems. If you come to me, I will heal you of your diseases of the soul. And between the time that you receive Jesus and go to the life beyond, we're gonna experience that healing. Now it's not physical most of the time, but it's spiritual, it's emotional, and it's real. He frees you from the past, from regret, through forgiveness of sin. He gives you peace in the moment that you live in right now, a confidence to face tomorrow, knowing that you'll have the strength to deal with tomorrow with whatever comes, because God gives grace when we need it. And most of all, a purpose, that when you wake up tomorrow, you are gonna do something significant with your lives. Can you imagine the disciples sitting there in the grass, learning that they can't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be something else that Jesus did that they get to be a part of and their mind gets blown a little more because they had chosen to set that adaptive cruise control and to follow. Not any faster, but also not any slower. And then I wonder about lunch. We're hungry, but you and I could go without lunch. Most of us in here could skip a meal. Many of us could skip several meals. It would not kill you, even though you think it might, to miss meals for three days. People do that. Jesus did it. You'd be uncomfortable. As long as you drink water, you'd be all right. So I'm thinking, what's the big deal? Why would Jesus be so concerned about the crowd that he has to feed them? Why wouldn't he just say, go? Why wouldn't he say, be a little smarter next time and make sure you prepare ahead of time and pack your lunch like the little boy? Because I think there's a third and very personal level or element to this. And that is that Jesus' compassion extends to you right now in the moment with the things that make your heart heavy even though in the big scheme of eternity or even the chronology of a timeline of your life, they may be insignificant. To Jesus, they're not insignificant. That he was moved with compassion that compelled him to action and he met. The eternal need, the lifelong need, and he'll meet your needs in this moment. That's a blessed life. Blessings may be material. They might be stuff. They might be promotions. They might be achievements. They might be things your kids do or accomplish. But to be blessed means that your eternity is secure, that your life is taken care of, and that the needs and desires of your heart in this moment, that God sees, that he cares, and that he gets involved. That's blessed. And that's what the disciples were learning. A generous life is a blessed life. Father, as we close this time,